Hello there, good people. What is up? Welcome, my name is Marco and I'm a full stack developer. As promised, this is going to be a crash course for beginners to learn JavaScript. I won't get into the details about what JavaScript is or how it was born, I mean the history. I want this to be a hands-on approach. So there will be the explanation part and also the try and do it part. To set up this course, there are a couple of things that you need. First, you need some type of text editor. Atom, Sublime Text, Notepad, I'm going to use VS Code, just the default VS Code. Second, you need to have Node.js installed. Don't worry, just go to the Node.js website and download the most up-to-date version. This will allow you to run your JavaScript code directly from the terminal. As an alternative, you could use your browser as well. Just open an empty tab and then right-click, go to Inspect for opening the DevTools, then Console. And here you can write all the JavaScript that you want and it will also run. Let's introduce this course. I think that almost all programming languages are very similar to one another. As a matter of fact, if you already know one, it comes very easy or at least easier to learn a new one unless we're talking about C or C++. That's because there are key elements that are common to most programming languages. In this course, I want to focus on these key points and I have identified six. They are variables, how do you declare them, data types and structures, conditionals and booleans, loops, like for and while loops, functions, and last but not least, classes. Knowing this doesn't make you an expert of the language, but they are the fundamental bricks that can help you to get started in building your projects. So hopefully after this course, you should be able to write code in JavaScript and also to write entire projects with it. Let's start with variables. They are the key point in all programming languages. If you want to store a value or something, you need a variable. The name can be confusing though, because variables are basically memory allocations of values. It's like giving the language an address. When you say x is equal to 12, you are assigning 12 to x. So now x has a physical address in memory. And when you call x, you're basically saying, go to that address and get me that value. Why is it confusing then? Because even if they're variables, they're not really meant to vary or change. Sure, you can modify them along the line, but best practice says that you should try and minimize the number of time you reassign a value to a variable. In JavaScript, there are three ways to declare variables and they always must be declared. Now we have the var, the let, and the const keywords. These are reserved keywords, meaning they have semantic value for JavaScript. Hence, you can't use them as variable names, for instance. Now, the var belongs to ancient history. is deprecated, so don't even consider it. If you see some old code with it, you know that it is assigning a variable, but that's it. What I want you to focus is let and const. Let is more common and is scope-based. That means that it belongs to where it is declared. If you declare it out in the open like this, then it's global. Every object can see it. But most importantly, it can also be reassigned somewhere else. Pay attention because if you reassign a variable with let in the same scope, you're basically overwriting the previous value. And if I run this code, you see that the first value is six and the second is eight. I have no way to go back to six. On the other hand, const is by default globally scoped. This means that it cannot be redeclared somewhere in your code. You are not allowed by language itself to reassign a value to it. You will get an error or a warning. So const is used for those values that you know you're not going to change or reassign along the line. Things like placeholder values like i or j or k must not be declared with const. If I try and run this code, I get an error which is assigning to constant variables. Now, as a quick and brief exercise, try from this pseudocode to declare all the variables. You can stop the video and try yourself. Okay, let's declare the name and the surname variable with const because they never change. Name and surname, okay. And then we're gonna use let for the language equal, for now I'm gonna say English, okay? Let's run the code and see what happens. Good. Some best practices with variables in JavaScript. 
Let's start with naming convention. In JavaScript, it is recommended to use comma case, and it looks like this. Uh, basically, the first letter of each word is uppercase, all but the very first one. Secondly, and this goes for every programming language you'll ever use, variable names should be descriptive. Things like n or m and r, they're not very good, but like number of days in a month, or mean precipitation in millimeters, or radius, are way easier to read and to understand. In addition, try to declare variables when you need them, not at the top or at the bottom, but just when you need it. If you need a particular variable, initialize it there and then. By the way, initialize means declare it. There can be several data types in JavaScript, but the most common are strings, which are used for text, names, labels, etc. Numbers, which is for numbers, of course, and booleans, which is true and false. There are others, of course, but these belong to the category of primitive data types. An example of non-primitive are arrays and objects. These are the most common in JavaScript. Now, arrays are introduced with square brackets, and they represent a collection of items. These items can be primitives or other data types, even arrays. In that case, you would have a multi-dimensional array, but that is not important now. Objects on the other hand are very powerful and very useful. They are introduced by curly brackets and the logic inside is very straightforward. Everything is based on a key value pair combination. The key is basically the name or the indicator and the value is, well, the value of that thing. Objects are super fun to work with because as for arrays, they can be nested with other data types. You can have strings, booleans, arrays, and even other objects. How do you use them? Every data type has a series of methods, which are inherited functions that add features to our data. For instance, the filter method in arrays can return a new array with only the values that satisfy a specific condition. In this case, I only want the items that are of type number. If I run this code, I will get one. Basically, it's the only number inside. There are other array methods, and you should spend some time getting to know at least some of them, like map, or for each, or reduce. Another key feature of arrays is that they have an index. The index is just a locator, or an address, that indicate a specific point in the array itself. To specify this index, you just call the array, square brackets, and then the index itself. Now, let's see what this brings out. It prints out two, which is this element right here. This might look confusing. After all, I asked for the item and index one. Why didn't it print one? Well, indexing starts from zero, and you must be careful about that. It always starts from zero. So I have zero, one, two, three, and four. If we want to know the length of the array, we have access to the length attribute just like this. Now, if I print this, I will get 5. Now, the length only indicates the number of items inside the array, but the last item has an index that is the length minus 1. Repeat again, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Objects are more fun in my opinion. You can access values with the dot notation. You select the object, then dot and whatever key you want to grab. In the same way, you can also insert values. If you do like this, just the object dot the key you want to add, and then its value. If I now print this object, you'll see this last part was added. It must be noted that JavaScript doesn't like spaces. So if you had, for instance, a key like job description, you won't be able to use the dot notation. Instead, you can use the square brackets, just like this, and specify the name of the key. This should return exactly the same. Yeah. Simple exercise as before. Stop the video and read the instructions. Okay, so let's declare the array, square brackets, and I'm just gonna start adding random numbers. 600, 600. Then let's create the object. I'm just gonna call it my object. Curly brackets and I want a name key, 
this is going to be my name then a job which in this case is going to be a developer okay and then i need to assign a new key to this object so my object dot lucky number equal the third element now the third element means this and as we saw before to indicate this element, I need to get access to the second index because it's 0, 1, and 2. So in here, I will put 2. And then I'm going to console log my object. Dot name, dot job, and lucky number. I save it, and if I run this, I can see that my lucky number is 56. Good, we are starting to get to the core of JavaScript. This is a very important thing that allows you to control the flow of your script, check conditions, etc. Conditionals are also referred to as if statements. And to be quite honest, they are very similar to plain English, thankfully. You would use them as you would in a normal conversation. If something is true, then do this, otherwise, do something else. Now, there might be some confusion sometimes when specifying multiple conditions. And this is due to Boolean logic, true or false. And it's important you understand this in order to always write conditionals correctly. In normal calculus, one plus one is equal to two. We can have operations for Boolean values as well. And the tools that allow those operations are called operators. Here we have the AND operator and the OR operator that in JavaScript are represented like the double and percent and the double pipe. These operators represent a logic gate through which a particular statement must pass. It goes without saying that if the result of adding two numbers is a number, operation of two booleans returns a boolean, so true or false. The AND operator dictates that all the condition must be true at the same time for the operation to result true. If I run this code, I get true, because 35 is greater than 20 and it's also smaller than 40. However, if I put 60 and I save it and try to run it again, I get false because 60 is greater than 20. However, it is not smaller than 40. So this is true and this is false. And with the AND operator, true and false is equal to false. On the other end, the OR operator needs only one condition to be true to evaluate the entire operation as true. If I run the same code now, I will get true because the number is greater than 20 and it's also smaller than 40. But if I change this and save it, it will return true as well because this is true. The number is greater than 60 and this is false. But in Boolean logic, with the OR operator, true or false is equal to true. We can also have multiple conditions we want to evaluate in an IF statement. We can do so with the else if keyword. Check the first condition. If that is false, well then check this other one. Finally get to the else, which can be translated into the in all other cases, do this. Again, let's do one basic exercise with conditions. Feel free to stop the video and find the solution. Read the instructions carefully. So I'll declare an age. Let's put 16. And then a country. In this case, I'm going to put uh, Italy. Why not? Now it starts with the if statements. So if country is equal to Italy, and I want the end here, because the two conditions must be true at the same time. It's greater or equal to 18, because the drinking age in Italy is 18. I can say console log, I can copy this. Here's your drink, plain and simple. Okay, else if, and here I'm specifying the other condition, so if the other country is USA and the age is greater or equal than 21, the drinking age in the US is 21, 
Then I can console log the same exact thing. I can even copy paste. Else, which means in all the other cases, well, you can drink, sorry about. Sorry. Just what for you. Okay. So let's try and run this code. Just water for you because I'm 16 and I'm in Italy. But if I were 21 in Italy and I save it, I can drink. Now let's change this. Let's put 18. Yep, I can still drink in Italy. But if I go to the US, what happens? Nap. Just water for me. If this is your solution, it's totally fine, but there is also another way we can do this. If you notice here, we are console logging the same thing twice. And we can actually specify the condition in just one line. So let's do it like this. I'm gonna wrap this in parentheses like this. So this will be evaluated as one block. Then I can use the OR operator, double pipe, and I can evaluate this as a second block. Okay, this would eliminate completely the need for this. And what is happening here is basically, if this returns true, then I'm going to print this because the or is going to be true or false. Let's see if this works as well. Let's clear this. Just water for you. It works still. I can still drink. Loops are super useful in JavaScript. They unveil so many operations and delegate entire pieces of logic in a single place. What do I mean? Well, instead of writing steps one by one, like this, I can just provide a loop that feeds itself and when it's done, you'll have the answer. Now let's actually try and run this code. You can see that these two operations do the same exact thing. But in the for loop, I am delegating the counting to the loop itself instead of increasing it myself manually. The syntax in for loops is straightforward. Let's break it down in three steps. After the keyword for and open parentheses, you initialize a variable. And you can give it the name and value you want. However, that will determine the behavior of your loop. Second, you specify an exit condition. When that condition becomes true, the for loop stops iterating. Last, you provide a counter. Taking the variable, you make an operation that will allow it to reach the condition, otherwise you risk getting stuck in an infinite loop. Then there are while loops, and again, very similar to plain English. While a certain condition is true, you keep going, otherwise get out or break out the loop. In a way, you can consider for loops like compact cases of while loops. As a matter of fact, here I am initializing the variable, I am changing it, and I'm verifying an exit condition. While loops are risky, and you must be careful not to end up in an infinite loop. In this case, if you don't increase the i variable, you'll end up with an infinite loop. And let's try, see what it looks like. If I run this, yeah, I'm gonna stop it now. You can see that I've just printed a bunch of ones, because I never changed the i. But, if I now do this, and I clear the screen, run it again, it's not an infinite loop. Okay, for this exercise, I want you to combine what we have learned so far. So again, stop the video and try yourself. When you're done, play it and compare the solution. So as we saw before, we have to initialize the array and just give a bunch of numbers from one to nine, okay? And then I need to print each element with a for loop so for I initialize the variable, I give it an exit condition and I can get access to it with length and then I change the counter. This basically reads, starts from zero and remember the index always starts from zero. The exit condition is when you reach, when I reaches the, the length of the array and then for each operation, for each iteration increase the i and here I can just say console log array index i and this is for the for loop now let's see what I can do in the while loop as I said while loops 
For loops are compact cases of while loops. And we also need the same exact thing. So I need to initialize a variable. Then I need to specify an exit condition, which again is smaller than the length of the array. And then first thing first, let's change the counter. Okay, so we don't forget. But before that, I want to console log array at index j. If I save it and I run this, you see that we have 1 to 9 in the for loop and 1 to 9 in the while loop. Good job. Okay, this is the core, the power horse of any programming language, the option to create functions, which in a nutshell, they represent isolated blocks of logic. Creating a function can be as simple as adding two numbers or as complicated as plotting the regression of some data. Inside, you need to specify the logic, step by step, and at the end, you'll need to return a value. The return value can be anything, numbers, a string, an object, or even another function. To start, you use the function keyword, which is a reserved word in JavaScript, and the name, which is the name of the function. Inside the parentheses, you put the arguments of the function, which are those elements that a function needs to process. In the case of an add function, the arguments can be two numbers. And you can give them whatever name you want, but again, try to be descriptive. The return keyword specifies what the function must return, in this case, the result of the addition. In modern JavaScript, there is also another way we can declare a function. It's called the arrow syntax. You use the const followed by a name, equal, open parenthesis. Here you put the arguments, if any. If you don't have any, you just leave it empty. And then a fat arrow, and then describe the logic of the function. One last thing, a function written like this doesn't do anything. To work, a function must be called, and you do it invoking it by its name. So right here, I actually need to invoke it like this. Since I have a return value from this function, I can also cast the value into a variable. Now pay attention here, because to call and execute a function, I must invoke it with parentheses whether I have parameters or not. Otherwise, I won't execute the function, but I will only have an instance of it, which is very different. If I now try and console log this, you can see that the result is five. However, if I didn't put any parentheses here, the result is very different. I actually have a function. And this function can be used as the actual function. If I now say function two and three, it's gonna console log five as well. But it's not running this one, but it's running an instance of that function. Time for some exercise. Take your time, remember what you've learned so far. If you need to go back to certain parts of the video, do so. Okay, so first thing, I'm gonna create the function divide give it two arguments and say here I'm just gonna return a divided by b. This is my divide function. If you did this, that's a very good job. Now, for the advanced version, let's create a subtract function that never returns a negative number. So again, I have two parameters. In this case, I'm gonna use an if statement. So if a is greater then b, I'm going to return a minus b. Okay. If not, I'm going to return b minus a. Now, this syntax might look confusing, but uh, when I specify the return condition, the function actually stops. So we'll, if uh, a is greater than b, I'm going to return a minus b, and the function will stop here. If a is smaller than b, I will never even get to here. So I'm just gonna return this instead. But you can use it with the else statement if you are more comfortable with it. This is a more clean syntax. Okay, this is the last step in this crash course. Classes are fundamentals in object-oriented programming. 
you can create objects, inherit them from other classes, and do a bunch of stuff. Obviously, this is a crash course, so I won't get too deep into object-oriented programming fundamentals. Just know that classes represent blueprints of how an object is created. You can decide its default values, its attributes, and methods. Let's start from the syntax. To create a class in JavaScript, you use the class keyword. This is modern ES6 syntax, and a name, which is the name of the class itself. Class names are always camo case, but the first letter is uppercase as well. And this is to differentiate between classes and functions. Inside, we can put variables and functions, which in this context are called methods. One method that must be called when initializing a class is the constructor. This method specifies all the attributes that our class must have. Now, how do I use a class? I can create a variable, and then I use the new keyword to specify that I am creating a new object of some kind, and then I give it the name of the class. For example, I want to create a new circle object, and this is going to be a new circle. You'll notice that if I hover over it, VS Code tells me that this class takes an argument, which is the radius. This is thanks to the constructor method, where I specify that to initialize this class, I need a radius. So I give it a radius. Three. Why not? Now that I have created the object, it comes easier to explain what the these words inside the class mean. This refers to the instance of the class. Since you cannot know all the possible names an object can have, you just refer to it as this. In this case, this refers to circle, so this dot radius stands for circle dot radius. As a matter of fact, if I now print it, I should see in the console. Three. As it is now, this class is not very useful. This is why I can add methods so that I have access to a bunch of functionalities belonging to the class itself, and therefore to the instance of it, in this case, circle. Methods can just be declared inside the class as functions. They take parameters and return a value, or not. If I want to add a area method, I can just do it like this. And then I return a value. I have access to the radius. So the area of a circle is pi times radius squared. So I can get access to the met.py value times this dot radius, and this means to the power of 2. Okay, and now if I want to see the area of this, I just need to execute it. And remember, it is a method, so I need the parentheses. If I save it and run it, I will get this is the area. There are a bunch of methods I can create here, like circumference, the arc, semi arc, whatever. But methods can also change internal attributes of the instance. Let's say that this circle has also coordinates, like the x coordinate and the y coordinate. Now I want to implement methods that can move the circle. As you can see, this class is starting to get larger, and this is the great thing about classes. They can store an immense amount of information and functionalities that will be available directly from an instance of the class. In this case, if I want to move my circle up, I just call the method. If I run this piece of code, I should see the x change. And in fact, I do. So basically, my circle object has moved right of one pixel unit. You decide. All right, last exercise for this video. I know you can do it. Stop the video and try yourself. Okay, so let's start with the class keyword and call it square. This is going to be my class. Then open parentheses and I call the constructor method. Inside, I just need the side. And this dot side would be equal to the side. Then I specify the methods. I need the area. I need the perimeter. And I need the diagonal. Okay. Now inside the area, well, the area of the square is just this dot side 
times this dot side. Pretty straightforward. The perimeter is this dot side times 4. This is a geometry. I think we can all agree that this is correct. But I need to return it, of course. <laughs> Last but not least, this might have been like the only one tricky, but the diagonal is basically equal to the side times, and here I need to use the math module, the square root of 2. Okay? And last but not least, I want to create a square. So square, it's a new square. I need to specify the length of the side, let's say 5. Here I can console log different things. For example, I can console log the area of the square. And just like this, I can console log the perimeter and the diagonal as well. Diagonal. Beautiful. Now let's put this code right here and let's see what it does. Beautiful. 25 is the area, 20 is the perimeter. This odd number is the diagonal, which is always longer than the sides, by the way. One last thing, and this is for best practice, don't try and change the attributes of an instance outside the class. You should always provide methods inside the class to change values, also called setters, and get values or getters, like this. So instead of doing this, do this. This is much better. Okay, I think this is it for this course. I hope it was instructive and helpful for you. I honestly had a lot of fun doing it. And if you had any other questions or requests, just let me know in the comments below. Now, this was a crash course and it covered the key points, the fundamentals of JavaScript or something that I think is fundamental. However, there is so much more to this language and I encourage you to check it out. Starting from arrays and objects methods to callback function and just the async await syntax, a good place you could check out is freecodecamp.org. There are tons of courses, it's very interactive and it really goes deeper in what I've explained here. You might already be familiar with it, but I will leave the link in the description below, so feel free to check it out. It's totally free and I think it's totally worth it. This being said, if you enjoy this content, please leave a like and share so that more people can see it. And don't forget to subscribe. This will really, really help this channel grow. Thank you very much for watching. I hope to see you in the next video. And as always, stay tuned for more and bye bye.